So thanks again for coming. And um, what we've got up here is the one book page that you can look at and see where uh, what events are coming up, including the essay contest. I know that there's an event um, this afternoon for um, people who are going to be boarding a bus and riding down to Roger Williams College to hear Sonny Lax, Henrietta Lax's son speak, and I, I believe there might still be a couple of seats left on that in, in case people are interested. Good, so, um, so today we, that's okay. Um, so for the ethics panel today, the plan is that um, Two of us from BCC, Katie Grinnell from the biology department and I'm Phyllis Mentmer from the psychology department, um, we're each going to be giving a short um, little overview of a study that was important um, in our fields to um, the issue of research ethics with human participants. And then we're going to be turning it over to um, a special guest who's here today from Wheaton College, Teresa Salata who does research in um, bioethics and medical ethics and um, has a special interest in international research and ethical issues that come up with human participants in an international context. So um, we're saving the best for last and uh, Teresa's going to go at the end. Um, Katie's going to start and uh, talk a little bit about the Tuskegee um, study and then I'm going to get up and talk a little bit about the Milgram experiment and why that was important um, in the field of psychology. And at each, at each um, point, after we're done um, discussing the study, we'd like to ask, you know, you know, to think about any kinds of questions that come to mind, and we'll take questions right then. We also hope to have a little bit of time at the end for questions. Um, so that's the overall plan. There's a microphone set up here and here, but we also have a couple of um, faculty on call in case you're more comfortable just raising your hand and having somebody bring you the microphone for your question. We can do it that way, too. All right, so I'm going to turn things over to Katie. Okay. I know this is a very attractive slide to start on. Can you guys hear me okay? Okay. Um, I'm just going to preface this by saying that I'm, I'm by no means an expert in the field of ethics. So if anything comes up, if something seems confusing in this brief uh, slideshow, just stop me, okay? How many of you, just a show of hands, have read some or all of the Henrietta Lacks book? Okay, that's awesome. Okay. So you see a reigning theme throughout the book is this notion of informed consent, right? Being informed of what's being asked of you, what's being done to you in a particular study. And so the study that I'm going to present to you today is the Tuskegee syphilis study. How many of you have heard of the Tuskegee syphilis studies? <clears throat> Good. Okay. So I thought I would, I would start with this beautiful slide about syphilis. Okay. <laughs> I'm sure most of you have heard of syphilis before. <laughs> syphilis is a sexually transmitted disease, right? It's the gift that keeps on giving. In 2010, there were 45,834 new cases of syphilis, so still very present uh, in society. It's transmitted by direct contact between people with syphilitic sores, okay, and it's passed by sexual content, what's that content, contact, um, and passed from mother to child. So still very relevant, treatments are still very much needed. A little bit about it, it's caused by a bacterium, and you can the picture over here, Treponema pallidum. Okay, that's the bacterium that causes syphilis. And you'll see on the next slide, there's a diff uh, depending upon the stage of syphilis that you're exhibiting, there's different antibacterial treatments for it. But nonetheless, it's treatable in today's day and age. Um, it exists in three stages: a primary stage where the patient presents with open sores, a secondary stage, and you can see two pictures up there where you have lesions on the skin, sometimes on the hands, on the back. Um, and then this third, very severe stage where it becomes known as neurosyphilis. And so you have tremors, headaches, memory loss, very extensive symptoms. Um, depending upon, it, as with anything else, the earlier it's caught, the better the, you know, the outlook as far as treatment goes. Treatment will never prevent the damage that's already been done, but it will, um, should say stave off any future damage. And the reason there's a picture of a box of condoms is obviously abstinence and protection is the only way to protect yourself against syphilis. Okay. 
So I just took a screenshot of the current treatments, and you can see depending upon what stage of the disease that you're exhibiting, you choose from a host of different antibiotics with different uh, rigors. Okay. <clears throat> so why are we talking about the Tuskegee syphilis studies, and why were they conducted? And again, if you have any questions, feel free to stop me, and I might refer you to Teresa or to Phyllis. But um, right around the Tuskegee syphilis studies were conducted from 1932 to 1972. It was originally supposed to take six months. It took 40, it went on for 40 years. Okay, a little bit of a difference in timeline. Um, in 1926, syphilis was this national epidemic. It was estimated that 35% of people of reproductive age had syphilis. That's a lot of people. Okay. Um, the current treatments around the late 20s, early 30s, to the best of my knowledge, were sort of heavy metal treatments, um, which you can imagine were pretty toxic. Okay, if you think about like current chemotherapy, how cytotoxic that is, it'll kill other cells besides cancer cells. Heavy metal treatment did get rid of the syphilis, but it also made people very ill, if not die. So at the time that the study started in 32, there really, really were no established treatments. Okay. As it went on into 1940, penicillin was the current treatment. Um, but as it says on that final bullet point, this was around the time that the stock, mar stark stock market crashed and the Great Depression uh, came to be. So there was an immense lack of funding for distributing you know, penicillin and other drugs to the population at large, specifically impoverished minority populations. <clears throat> So this was the basis behind um, the starting of this. The official name of the study was the Tuskegee Study of Untreated Syphilis in the Negro Male. Okay. And it was conducted by the US Public Health Service, or the PHS, um, in conjunction with the, the Tuskegee Institute in Macon County, Alabama. The Tuskegee Institute, to give you a brief, brief introduction of what they did, um, it was run largely by white males, but it was to foster sort of the career development of young African-American males in Macon County. Um, the purpose was to record the natural history of syphilis, how it progressed in these males, um, in the hopes of justifying a course of treatment. However, the overall viewpoint of the study was to trace how syphilis progressed when it was, while it was untreated. So they went fully into this study knowing that no one would receive treatment for syphilis. Okay. So what did the study include? Six, almost 600 men were enrolled. Oh no, 600. <laughs> can do the math. 399 with syphilis, 201 who did not have the disease. Okay. The big issue is were they informed or not? Okay. They were informed, once they were enrolled in the study, that they had something called bad blood. I'm not sure how many of you have heard this part of the study before. They were just told they had bad blood. Okay. At the time, bad blood, as it says on the slide, was used to refer to a whole host of ailments. So it could be syphilis, okay, which this did include, anemia, so lack of iron in the blood, or just general fatigue and malaise. So there were these posters like you can see up here, that were advertising for these men to come in and give blood to see if they did in fact have bad blood. And then they were enrolled in the study. So they were told that they had bad blood, not necessarily that they had syphilis. Okay. And I'm going to do a terrible job of reading this because I'm not close enough to hear or to hear. But can I wheel this? Thank you. I found this online. I just I kind of remarked at the way that this letter is put together because if you've ever had surgery in the last 10, 15 years or you've taken your kids to get treated, it's the medical documents are written in such legalese. And if you read the letter, I know the page is curved, but it says, "Dear sir, some time ago you were given a thorough examination, and since that time we hope you have gotten a great deal of treatment for bad blood. You will now be given your last chance to get a second examination." This examination is a very special one, and after it is finished, you will be given a special treatment if it is believed you are in a condition to stand it. Okay, special treatment, special treatment, nothing specified any further. The part that I kind of remark at is she will, they're talking about the nurse, okay, she will bring you to the Tuskegee Institute Hospital for this free treatment. We will be very busy within these, ex 
within these examinate or when these examinations and treatments are being given and we'll have lots of people to wait on. You will remember that you had to wait for some time when you had your last examination and we wish to let you know that because we expect to be so busy it may be necessary for you to remain in the hospital over one night. I can't help but look at this and think if you were to be given this today <laughs> you'd be nothing short of horrified, right? Like there's no way I would sign this form. <laughs> like I'd be marching to my death. But and then they tell you that you're going to have free meals and a bed and the examination will be covered. Well, I hope so because they're just telling you you're just going to be sitting in the hallway basically waiting. Okay. So these were the forms at the time. These were the forms that were given to the men who were enrolled in the study. What did the men get out of this? Okay, one would think if you were entering into a study for something, right? What's the general consensus? If you enroll in a study or you enroll in a clinical trial, what are you hoping to get out of it? Results, Results right? Some further progress on the disease. Right, that's kind of what I would be hoping for, that I'm one of those people who gets the treatment and not the placebo. That's personally what I'd be hoping for. But the men did not get any syphilis treatment. They weren't given the heavy metal treatments. They weren't given penicillin. Okay. So again, they were informed that they were being treated for bad blood, but they weren't given anything to sort of stave off the progression of the disease, even though treatments did exist, however poor they might have been when the, tr when the study started. They did receive free medical exams, but again, this also benefited the research team. Free meals, and this would have been a red flag for me, burial insurance. <laughs> I'm, no, I'm just, <laughs> no, I'm just saying. I don't want to be in a study that gives me free burial insurance. <laughs> so we mentioned it was supposed to last six months. It went on for 40 years. And it's a bit of a difference, right? That doesn't really exist nowadays with the lack of funding taking it on for <laughs> many, many more years. So just, I, I'm not going to take up too much time because we have a lot to cover today, but what happened? What was the fallout from this study? So in 1973, a year after the study was concluded, the story of what actually took place, that these men were not being actively treated, even though it was known that they had syphilis and certain treatments existed, um, any remaining subjects that were still alive were kind of horrified. They had been wronged. So a small group of survivors pursued a lawsuit against the doctors <clears throat> excuse me, and the federal government who were supporting the public health service. Um, in 73, the lawsuit ended in victory for any remaining participants. Collectively, they were awarded $10 million to split between the living uh, syphilis patients and the families of the deceased patients. And in 1997, President Bill Clinton formally apologized um, for the injust injustice done to these men. So. At this time, I just kind of like to know, do you have any questions? What are your thoughts and feelings about, you know, was anything wrong done to these men? If they hadn't enrolled in the study, let's just make it clear that they probably would not have re received any treatment at all, right? Is that fair to say? I mean, they weren't going to, I don't think if they were left to their own devices that they would have received treatment for syphilis. So how many degrees of wrong is this, really, right? What, do you, what are your feelings on this, quickly, before I... Yeah. Why was it that only 600 black mm -hmm. men were selected for the study? Why? Black men. I think that I, I don't. I don't know the reason for this, but I think they purposefully targeted this impoverished population that they thought maybe it would be like an easy target audience. That they, they were. Yeah, right. What I white people too. Right. 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 What I heard is that um, it was a particular problem in this area in the south. Yeah, and I would add that, which, I mean, clearly the racism of the South at that time, mm -hmm. it was believed, first of all, some of the racist stereotypes were that black men were very promiscuous. Mm -hmm. That was one of the, the really negative stereotypes at the time. So there was this belief, and I mean, clearly it was not less true of white men than syphilis, <laughs> but um, <coughs> it was also easier to target a population with less formal education with ne less knowledge of um, the um, rights that they had. 
So it made it possible to carry out this research because they just, they, it was less likely that there would be any problem. Well, that's kind of, it kind of follows, even though this is after, it, depending upon where in the study you talk, it's very in line with Henrietta Lacks because the same thing went on with her. I mean, she and her family, up until what later in the 70s, they were drawing blood from her children and still not telling them what they were taking blood for. So. Right. It's worth noting that the Tuskegee study, when it started in 1932, there was not a uh, consensus around medical treatment that was available. So for the first six years, it's not clear how ethically problematic it was. It was a course of disease studies. The aim was just to see, and we do course of disease studies all the time. We don't have a treatment for this condition. Let's watch how it progresses. And if we learn something about the disease, maybe that will help us find a treatment. It wasn't until penicillin became available and we knew it could treat syphilis in the 40s and it was withheld. Then we get into really big problems. But when the study started, it wasn't so ethically problematic. I mean, there wasn't the issue of treatment being withheld because there wasn't consensus about it. In the 1940s, which was just before the beginning of the Second World War, uh, what was the, because there was certainly a national distraction because of the war, uh, how did the focus remain on this particular uh, experiment, or whatever you want to call it, uh, and uh, because penicillin became very, very much available uh, among the armed forces uh, in the Second World War? for very much the same reason. I might defer this to you, but I, it, part of it was cost, right, of penicillin administering it. They kind of, the government decided who Well, what I it. read was that in the, um, in the 40s, arguably, they were conserving some of the penicillin because they wanted it to go to the soldiers. They wanted it to be available, and they weren't able to produce it. Is, you know, is inexpensively and to make a lot of it. So arguably, you know, they, there's an explanation for why it wasn't distributed in the 40s, but certainly after <coughs> World War II was over and we knew how to make it and it was easily made and we could make a lot of it, um, to withhold it at that point. I mean, there's no, the justification that was offered was the committee actually met, committees met every year to approve continuation of the study. Um, because as Katie said, initially it wasn't supposed to be a 40-year study. But every year they reviewed it and said, well, let's continue. Might as well continue to follow the course of disease. And once the uh, penicillin became available, committees continued to meet. And what they said was, this is our last opportunity <coughs> to follow the course of untreated syphilis. Because penicillin is available now. And people will take it. So this is our last opportunity. And this is one of the big reasons why the case is you know, talked about so much in bioethics today. Because <coughs> here, clearly, answering scientific questions were put ahead of the welfare of individuals. It's uh, <coughs> me, worth noting that, uh, that at the time of the experiment, that, that when it was initiated, that there was no protocol for the uh, for use mm -hmm. uh, or the uh, matter of consent, right. in, in, informed consent. It, uh, that came directly out of the Second World War, the Holocaust, which produced something called the, uh, well, some years after, the Belmont Report. Uh, so, in a, in a strangely, historically weird way, I hate to say it, but you know, some of the uh, devious medical experiments that were occurring during the Holocaust, dare I say, uh, were replicated here. That's just to make a distinction between, uh, you know, attitudes uh, at, at the time when the experiment was initiated, but after the Belmont Report was produced, I guess around the 50s, uh, I believe around the early 50s, it's shocking to me that uh, this you know, the experiment, the Tuskegee experiment, exper uh, continued after, decades after that fact, mm -hmm. even though there had been this international standard on the use of human subjects. I think that's partly why it's still so prominent in ethics today, I would think. Uh, and a parallel uh, course of this, I mean, I guess we're willing to believe that medical knowledge was rudimentary or very barely out of the bleeding stage uh, uh, in, 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 as late as the 30s. Uh, in a parallel uh, situation in World War II again, 
uh, the effects of radiation, and it's something I'm a little familiar with. It, um, there was no knowledge about uh, mm -hmm. what would happen. Uh, and just in the, like, you know, it, uh, but uh, it, it goes from medical, and I think we slide over as it continues, as Howard pointed out, we, we move into the ethical point of view because again, into the 70s and even the 80s, there was still unconscionable experimentation with radiation just so we, we have to know more mm -hmm. about what will affect when we use the nuclear weapons to wipe out the entire humanity anyway. Uh, so there is, you know, I'm willing to believe that no one, uh, as I studied it, no one really realized what would happen, the after effects of the use of the nuclear weapon, of the atomic mm -hmm. bomb. Uh, and, and okay, so we're gonna study it, but to be up in the 70s, and it strikes me in the 70s, I and mean, this is right after the 60s, when we had all of this, uh, you know, social change and uh, these things are unconscionable, and so it happened with the radiation as well as with the Tuskegee and as Howard pointed out with mm -hmm. the uh, Holocaust uh, uh, terror terrorism as well. I know, because it wasn't that long ago, that's why. <laughs> no, I mean, it's really, uh, that, that's where we get into the mm -hmm. ethical situation. Right. I mean, why are they continuing this when they knew better medically? You might Google human radiation experiments. There were experiments in this country where people were not told and they were deliberately exposed yeah. to radiation. Yeah. I think you're referring to that. Exactly. I don't want to take up any of Phyllis's time. Can oh, I? No, that's fine. No, take another question. There's another question. Yeah. Well, in many instances, as far as radiation was concerned, uh, there was a great deal of ignorance uh, in the in the entire scientific community. And uh, as late as uh, the uh, the late 50s, early 60s, uh, they were burning uh, out of the uh, uh, incinerator at MIT. There are records that they were burning uh, radioactive uh, dressings that had been used in some uh, <coughs> Uh, surgical procedures that were there, and the background count in Boston uh, was uh, aberrant until they finally discovered you don't burn radioactive material because the 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 particles that uh, are what radioactivity is will be taken in the smoke and then dropped on the residents of Boston. So it's really not very far from us that things of that nature happen and it was a matter of ignorance uh, on the part of the scientific community mm -hmm. and moving into directions uh, where they didn't have a lot of information. Well, I think too with radiation, the effects can be so long lived or they don't present themselves for a while. So it's only when we're faced with a population that now all of a sudden is exhibiting all these symptoms and then we think, what did we do? And, but they yeah. weren't following protocol. The protocol mm -hmm. would have been to take background counts in the, mm -hmm. in the surrounding area near the MIT reactor, and they didn't do that. Mm -hmm. So that, that was a breach of well, protocol. That's, that happened a lot. Like in biotech, we talk about Love Canal and such, and that happened, unfortunately, a, a lot. I just had a quick question. You said that the study went on for 40 years. These studies have been going on for 40 years. These have never had like, side effects or anything? And, like, they never questioned, like, what kind of medical treatment were they getting for 40 years? No. So they just let the syphilis progress, as it would have if they had never entered the study. Hmm. Well, what finally stopped it? Was it the government, the medical community, the participants themselves? You're going to love this. The journalists. This study was not the secret. And it, we, we didn't have ethics committees and institutional <laughs> review, the review boards that we have today. Um, but it was, it was no secret. There were documents. And as I said before, committees met every year. And a journalist just came across this. It, it wasn't a secret. And the journalist was horrified. And the journalist wrote about it. I'm just, oh, yeah, no, I, you don't mind if I wait till the end. Is that OK? It's OK. I'll be up here forever. I just keep talking. <laughs> Well, it's interesting that um, Howard or Professor Tinberg asked the question or made the point about um, the um, Holocaust and the role that the Holocaust played because the experiment that I wanted to talk about today that was really um, important within um, 
social psychology and psychology in general is the Stanley Milgram experiment. Some of you may have heard of this experiment before, certainly if you've taken general psychology before. How many of you have heard about the Stanley Milgram experiments? Okay, not, not quite as many as I might have guessed. So um, what I thought I would do is um, just give a brief overview of the Stanley Milgram experiment, what he was interested in, what happened. I'm going to talk you through that kind of briefly. And then I want to um, tell you a little bit about this person, Gina Perry, who kind of parallels Rebecca Skloot. Because what Gina Perry did um, just recently, her book was published last spring, was decide to follow up on the Milgram experiment, trace the participants in that study, interview them at length, and figure out more about what happened to them and you know, what it was that they carried with them in the years following the experiment. She also discovered, she's an Australian psychologist, and she discovered that in Australia, they did a replication of this experiment with college students. And she was able to track down some of those people who participated back in the 1970s and interview them, as well as people who had been experimenters then. So I would like to be able to show you a clip um, of a news program that was done about this Australian study in the 70s where you get to hear a couple of those participants talk about what it was like and there's some footage of the original Milgram experiment. So first I'm just going to give a little overview of the experiment itself, then show you the clip. I might cut it short a little bit. It's an eight minute long clip which is a little long, so I might cut it short a little bit. And then I just have a few questions for you to think about, similar to the types of questions that Katie threw out there, too, and it, the, the, the connection back to, the, um, to one book. So just very briefly, the, the Stanley Milgram experiments, um, well, I should start with just the, the main experiment. It, Stanley Milgram was fascinated with what had happened in Germany during the Holocaust. And in particular, Adolf Eichmann, who was a key organizer and very prominent in um, the Holocaust, he was a Nazi, and he was, being, he was under, um, undergoing a famous trial in Israel in the 1960s, early 1960s. And Stanley Milgram, who was a 27-year-old um, psychologist who was very, very ambitious. He was a professor at Yale University in Connecticut. And he really wanted to make a name for himself. He was trying and trying to come up with things that he could do to make a big splash. And he tried a couple of other things that hadn't worked so well. And then he came up with this big idea. And his big idea was to try to figure out if those of us who um, are, we might consider ourselves just regular, everyday individuals, if we were put in a particular situation, like the situation that many of the Nazi, um, many of the soldiers who were overseeing the concentration camps, if we were put normal people in that kind of situation, what might, what, how might they behave? And he wanted to try to figure this out, um, but he knew he was going to have to involve a lot of deception. So he sent out letters through the newspaper to people who lived around in the New Haven area, and he got 40 men to participate. He gave them $4.50 each. At the time, that was actually a lot more money than it is now. There was one um, psychology professor who likes to tell his students that it was worth 22 beers. $4.50. So... Um, he offered them this amount of money to come in, and when they arrived, they were um, told that they had an option, that, that he was interested in studying learning and memory, and that they were going to be selecting randomly if they were going to be the teacher or the learner. It was rigged, and they all selected that they were going to be the teacher, and the so-called learner who they met went back into another room, and every time that that man got an answer wrong on the memory test, that the teacher, the participant, was giving the learner, what the teacher was supposed to do was shock the learner with an electric shock machine that went from 15 volts all the way up to 450 volts. You'll see a picture of this in the little clip. And each time that the person got one wrong, the level of shock went up, up and up and up. Um, at the end of the experiment, oh, and I should say that at, at the, before Milgram started this experiment, he went around and asked psychologists and psychiatrists, what percentage of people do you think would actually do this? And everybody interviewed said less than 1% of individuals would. And does anybody remember how many people went all the way up to 450 volts? 
Yeah, I heard someone say 70. You're, you're almost right. 65% of the people in the study went all the way up to 450 volts. And 100% of the people in the study went up to 300 volts. Okay? But when you see them, when you see them in the video in just a couple minutes, you'll see that it was not easy for them. They, this, they did not take this lightly. Milgram was standing there, and as they started to have their doubts about what they were doing and started to make comments about how, are you sure this isn't really harming you know, the, the learner back there? Are you sure that you know, this is okay? He kept telling them, he was wearing a white lab coat at Yale University, and he kept telling them, the experiment must go on. It's, it's painful, but it's not going to kill them. You know, he, he, he was claiming that everything was going to be okay, and he kept telling them to keep going, to keep going. So what Gina Perry did was she thought there was just too much about this story that, you know, begged for more, um, you know, more of an investigation into whether or not Milgram did what he said that he was going to do, which was to debrief people. Debriefing started um, in the military around, um, during World War I, when um, pilots would come back from doing their missions, and before they were deployed again for another mission, they wanted to be able to talk to them, make sure they were okay, make sure they were psychologically sound and ready to go get some rest and go back out again. In World War II, we started doing it, and within the scientific community, debriefing became you know, an expected part of any kind of experimental um, protocol. And Milgram said that he had debriefed all of his subjects. You know, they'd come in, they participated, and then they were told nobody was actually hurt. It was all a tape. The screams that you heard when you, you know, flipped the switch were not real. You know, everything was, was made up here. You were actually the subject of the experiment not the learner back there. What we were really interested in was you. Now, when Gina Perry went to do her research, you'll see in the clip that that's not what she found. You know, that the, apparently, according to the participants themselves, they weren't debriefed. Um, so this raises these kinds of ethical questions, right, about it was because the Milgram experiment got so much attention. There were all kinds of articles and major newspapers written about it. There were psychologists attacking other psychologists, saying this is a terribly wrong thing to do, a terrible breach of trust. Um, so let me play this clip for you. As I said, I might, just in the interest of time, although I think that that, that is definitely not working. <laughs> um, in the interest of time, I'm, I'm going to cut it a little bit short, so that it, might, it might seem a little abrupt where I, where I clip it, where I end it. Oh, and I just should mention, too, because otherwise you're going to wonder. Remember on your way in, you were listening to that Peter Gabriel song with the bunnies hopping around? The, the point of that is that um, the Milgram study has actually inspired a lot of art. And Peter Gabriel wrote that We Do What We're Told song in 1986. So that's why we were playing it when you came in. Um, there is a connection. And the connection is that um, other artists have also been inspired by the Milgram study to um, create things. So that was just one example of that. Remember that um, Gina Perry is an Australian, um, an Australian psychologist, so you get the benefit of the Australian accent. <laughs> the Milgram experiments were among the most contentious in the history of so social psychology. They were the test that suggested 65% of people would inflict pain on others if directed to by authority figures. But the way the tests were done back in the early 60s stretched ethical boundaries so far that they helped lead to the strict standards that govern human experiments today. Few people have known that similar experiments were conducted here as part of coursework in Melbourne's La Trobe University in the early 70s. Mary Gearan reports. It is okay, I know, that the experiment doesn't define who I am. Yes, that question mark is there. And that's something that I did in my life that can never go away. I can't undo it. Diane Backwell faced a trial of conscience at the age of 19, something no current ethical committee would ever allow. And the staggering results of that day stay with her still. She's not alone. The shocking thing was that somebody will go to the point where they think they will hurt somebody, 
but also that I would participate in telling somebody to go to that point. A sense of shame that I, that I had deceived a, a, a friend. You really don't know how you're likely to behave until you get into a situation. An unknown number of students at Melbourne's La Trobe University took part in a variation of the controversial obedience experiments by Stanley Milgram. These are questions that concern me. His aim was to study destructive obedience, to see how many people would cause others pain when told to do so. But the volunteers themselves were told it was to study how well people learn through punishment. They thought they were administering real electric shocks as penalties for wrong answers. Let me out of here. You have no right to keep me here. Let me out. The shocks weren't real and neither were the cries of pain, but the volunteers didn't know that. Milgram's first published results showed 65% of people administered the maximum fake dose of 450 volts. The results, as I observe them in the laboratory, are disturbing. A wave of similar experiments followed across the globe, including published research by Sydney University academics. But what hasn't been acknowledged until now is that a variation of that experiment was also conducted as part of La Trobe's psychology course and not on the official records because it wasn't formal research. The La Trobe experiments were never published. They were, from what I can gather in my research, uh, an exercise for all first-year students. Psychologist and writer Gina Perry uncovered the La Trobe exercises. She says they followed Milgram's original experiment, except some subjects seem to have been recruited in part for altruistic purposes. At least two of them that I spoke to said that they'd been told that they were helping a friend who was at risk of failing their psychology course. And so it was for Diane Backwell. She sat behind the controls and before long she faced an awful choice. More and more errors were happening and her vocalisation was getting louder and I, I would say oh, this is just ridiculous, I can't keep doing this and they were prompting saying well you have to, you've committed to this. Then she was quiet, saying it now, it does seem ridiculous, but at the time I remember thinking, well, if she's already dead, then this isn't going to hurt her, and if I don't do it, then she's going to be kicked out of uni, so I just did it. What do you mean you did it? I gave her the shock, which, you know, obviously was the highest intensity. And What happened next compounded Diane Backwell's shock. They just started to laugh and was like, oh, it's not real, you weren't really shocking me, it was just an experiment, you were the one being experimented on. Diane Backwell took the results in a particular way. I inherently knew that was the inner core of me, that I would not do what human beings should do. It made it worse for Diane Backwell when she discovered other students did not go to maximum voltage, like Roger Standen. I pulled out, I can't remember where, but sometime reasonably early in the process. Why? Um, because I didn't like to inflict um, pain on the person on the other side. Now in retirement, Roger Standen says, looking back, the reason he stopped the experiment early was, in part, because the psychology student who recruited him wasn't authoritative enough. For that, he feels a great deal of relief. I always had this unease to think about if there was a different set of circumstances, would I have done something differently? I don't know. And that's a pretty scary thought. On the other side of the coin are the psychology students who recruited the volunteers. People like Colin MacDonald, now the Director of Student Engagement at Victoria University, and Maury Hazen, a teacher at the Australian College of Applied Psychology. They now both acknowledge that in fact their obedience was being tested as well. I did that because I was relatively obedient and because I'd been told to by my lecturers and because it was expected. While they didn't say their course results were at stake, they did manage to encourage their subjects to go to maximum voltage and were astonished by their subjects' reactions. Maury Hazen lost a friendship with his volunteer. He felt obviously very deceived by the whole process. Um, he was angry about that. But the, there was something very deep in his demeanour that suggested um, he'd seen something of himself 
that he uh, had trouble sitting with. They didn't choose to be put into that situation because they were misled about the real purpose of the experiment. Heading up the psychology department at the time was the now late Professor George Singer and in his team were Professor Bob Montgomery and Professor Kim Ng. Professor Ng says the Milgram exercises were effective but ultimately he and his team were sufficiently persuaded their use was unethical. In Gina Perry's book, Professor Montgomery disputes the dates quoted by some of the subjects interviewed and also insists there was a proper debriefing process. He wasn't available to speak to 7.30, but those we did speak to recall things differently. There was absolutely, categorically, no debriefing of me. As far as I'm aware, there was no de debrief program, either for the subjects or for us. In retrospect, I don't think it was sufficient, but at the time, it was a clear debriefing process. But, you know, do I think it was a, a good one? Mm, no. No. For Stanley Milgram, the pain of unwelcome self-knowledge was justified by the greater insight into humanity. I don't know who it's valuable to, but it sure wasn't valuable to me. I looked at it a different way and thought, we as a society are capable of doing that. Not just me, but a whole class of people. And therefore, it's, um, it, it's partly about me, but it's also about society. So thanks for, um, for watching that. Um, I was thinking that it might um, lead us to think about these types of questions for a moment or two before we turn things over to Teresa. Um, when I teach this, the story of the Stanley Milgram experiments in class, I'm always appreciative that there are some students who are willing to argue um, in favor of the experiment having happened, in favor of the, the access to the knowledge that we now have, because that's kind of a hard um, argument to make in light of that kind of video. Um, but, you know, thinking about it the way that Milgram thought about it um, is, you know, if you look at that middle question underneath the, the blue one, um, you know, if you think about it from the perspective of the participants who did go all the way, like the woman who was interviewed, Diane, um, we have to kind of weigh the potential pain of that self-knowledge that she now has um, against any kind of insights that you might think are worthwhile, or perhaps you don't think are worthwhile, um, that the Milgram research has offered us. So I just want to kind of throw that out there, see what, see what you think about that. Feel free to touch on any of these questions that are up here. Um, if you have ideas about, you know, if you were at La Trobe University, if you were in a position of leadership there, is there anything that you would want to do to reach out to these participants now? Um, and also that first one, is this experiment designed to be more of a moral test or designed to be um, a test of the power of the situation? Because Milgram was, um, you know, definitely wrote later about this as if, you know, the people who went all the way up to 450 volts had kind of failed a moral test. So do you think about it that way or do you think about it more as a, a way of um, looking at the power of, of a situation and, and how that situation can, can make us do things that we might, thought we might not have thought we were capable of doing? Any thoughts, Katie? I have a question. The woman, you said her name, Diane, Diane yeah. Student that was being shocked that they were going to get kicked out of the university. Yes, yeah. How do you dissect out, like, right. how much deception? I don't know if everybody could hear Katie's question, but she said um, she picked up that the woman who, um, who was talking about how the, the pressure she felt to keep going all the way up and follow the direction of the um, experimenter was under the perception, under the belief that her friend who was in the back room would get kicked out of university if she didn't continue on. And that's true, that was another level of deception that they were, that they were using. What sorts of thoughts do you have? Do you think it was uh, worth, I think that the pain that the people who went through um, experienced as participants is worth the knowledge that we now have or, or not? Any thoughts about that? Yeah, Josh. Told that you do have the right to uh, disobey an unlawful, unethical. 
So you're putting it in a larger context for us. I'm saying that you feel like there was a lot that was gained as a result of this. Good point. Jim. I, I think that uh, from my time in the service, that, uh, way back in prehistoric times, uh, before, uh, but uh, we, were, we, were, we were never mandated to obey an unlawful order. Uh, however, I'd like to uh, go back to this area uh, in uh, the ninth, in the Second World War, uh, and uh, uh, we very often, uh, uh, I think, uh, try to overlook some of the kinds of things that we were all, as a community, involved in, and that is, we had incarceration of German nationals uh, right down at uh, uh, the Cape uh, during the Second World War as well as incarceration of the Japanese, some Japanese citizens, uh, American, United States citizens, in, in, on, on the West Coast. And um, I, I think that a very good question is, uh, because you, you asked the question, to be a moral test, uh, that is morality uh, something that is timeless, or is morality uh, something that is a part of a time, of an epoch, if you will. And I think that that, I, that concept is, uh, is, is something that we shouldn't forget in our, in our conversation. Uh, because the, the 1930s with the other example uh, of civilists, uh, the, the, uh, I, I wonder, uh, by the way, I wasn't around in 1930. Uh, I wonder, however, if uh, you know the the moral judgment, the perspective was somewhat different than it might be in 2012. And the question is, uh, should our moral perspective, our ethical considerations, be timeless, or are they tied to the time? in which we live? I think it's a great question, and if you don't mind, I'm going to use it as a segue to Teresa's talk, because, um, because she's looking at not just the time, but the place, right? Like, what, we, what, what might be non-acceptable here now, right? No college professor could ever get an institutional review board to agree to let them do this experiment again here in the US because of all the regulation that took place following the Tuskegee and the Milgram and other important landmark um, experiments. But internationally, it's a different story. So we're going to pass the torch to Teresa and have her talk, tell us a little bit about her research and interests. to let me know when my time is running out so that I don't talk over, because I, I could talk here for hours, um, and you might not want that. Um, let me just say a, a few things. Um, let me just give you a little bit of history first, uh, because some of it's come up. So a reminder that the Tuskegee, the study of untreated syphilis, started in 1932, uh, ended in 1972. The Nuremberg Code was one of the earliest formal ethics codes, and that was issued at the Nazi doctor experiments trial. So um, after World War II, the Nazi doctors who were engaged in horrific experiments um, were put on trial, and as part of the judgment, the court issued what we now know as the Nuremberg Code, and it included 10 items. Um, Probably number one was the requirement for informed consent. If people are going to participate in research, they must give uh, an informed voluntary consent. And if they choose not to participate, they don't have to. Um, also part of the Nuremberg Code was one of the items was that science, answering a science question should not take precedence over the welfare of the human participants. 
Um, so 32 to 72 Milgram, 47 Nuremberg Code. So the Nuremberg Code was out while the uh, syphilis study was going on. Um, Milgram experiment was in the 60s. 1964, you get the World Medical Association um, issuing the Declaration of Helsinki, which is the World Medical Association's ethics code. That has been revised numerous times since 1964. Um, in 1966, there is a relatively famous article published by Henry Beecher in the New England Journal of Medicine in which he documented ethically suspect scientific studies involving human participants that had been performed to date. And he lists quite a few of them, including the syphilis study and the Milgram study, but there were quite a few. That was in 66. It wasn't until 1974 that the US really responded. And in 1974, the Congress passed the National Research Act into law. And what that act did was to create a commission for the protections of humans involved in research, in biomedical research. Um, that commission met over a number of years, and in 1978, their report, which is known as the Belmont Report, was published. That Belmont Report presents three ethical principles, and it says how those principles should be operationalized in the context of human research. The first principle was respect for autonomy. That is, we have to show a basic ethical principle is that you respect the decisions that people make for themselves. The second was principle of beneficence. That is, you should have a concern for the welfare of other people. And the third principle was justice. And what the Belmont Report does, it's a very readable document, and I urge you all to read it, is it talks about, okay, if these are three basic ethical principles, how do we show, show these? How do we operationalize them when we're doing research? And it talks about how, well, the way we show respect for individual autonomy or for people's rights to make decisions for themselves in the context of research is to, give, to ask them if they want to participate to give them the information they need to know to make a decision about participating, and they have the right to decline. Um, the way we operationalize beneficence or concern for the welfare of human participants is to do a risk-benefit a, a, a risk analysis. What are the risks of participating in the research? What are the benefits of participating in the research to the individual participant? And there has to be a proper balance. If the risks outweigh the benefits, the study should not happen. And finally, there are considerations of justice. And these largely concern who the participants in research should be. And they should be chosen um, for, for scientific reasons, right? The reasons that are appropriate to the study. Um, and they should be representative of the people who, would, uh, or who are vulnerable to get the condition that is being studied, um, if that's the sort of study it is. Um, and the people who bear the risks of the research should be the one who stand to benefit. So you don't want the people in the study to bear the risks, but people somewhere else to stand to benefit. Ideally, the people who bear the risks should be the people to benefit. So you can see that the U.S., a lot happened um, in this country and all over the world before the U.S. actually responded. So the Belmont Report comes out in 1978, and it's not until 19, um, 1981 that U.S. regulations are revised to reflect what was said in the Belmont Report. Okay, so just that little um, bit of history. I guess one of the points I want you to see is that Bioethics codes and regulations have largely been reactive. There has been what the Office of Human Research Protections in the, here calls um, an evolving concern. How have bioethics concerns and codes and regulations evolved after horrible things have happened? Right. So what I'm going to talk to you about, I'm going to tell you a tale of two studies. One was performed here in the US, and one was performed in Thailand. And these studies triggered a revision for the World Medical Association's Declaration of Helsinki. Okay, so here, let me tell you briefly about the two studies. And maybe what I'm going to do is just quickly tell you 
what the two studies were, and rather than raise the ethical objections um, that were raised about these studies, um, I'm just going to describe the two studies and leave it to you. So you can ask in the question period, um, you can tell me what you think of the studies. So the first study isn't terribly ethically problematic. It's known as the ACTG076 study. The ACTG is for the AIDS Clinical Trial Group. And this was a study they did. It was just given a number. This is standard 076. And for this study, um, this, was, this was done in the uh, 1990s. And this was a time before we had um, much in the way of treatment for our people who, had, who were HIV positive who might have AIDS, right? And we had just found that AZT was being, um, was useful, was useful as a treatment. And people wondered, well, we've got pregnant women who are HIV positive. Is there anything that we can do to prevent the transmission of HIV from the mother, the pregnant woman, to her child? And we knew that AZT was being used with people who had AIDS. And someone thought, well, what if we give AZT to the pregnant women? Might this prevent their passing on HIV to their child? So in the US, a study was conducted. It was a double-blind, placebo-controlled study. So there were two groups of participants. There were pregnant women. Um, an experimental group and a placebo group. The placebo group, if you know what a placebo is, it's an inert substance. The placebo group gets nothing. They get a substance that is inert. So in effect, they're getting nothing. Um, the experimental group gets AZT. They were given what's now known as the 076 regimen. They were getting AZT beginning in the first trimester, or the end of the first trimester of pregnancy. They got AZT daily during their pregnancy. Um, they, got, they were administered AZT when they were in labor, and when the child was born, the child was given AZT. Okay. Uh, the placebo group got nothing. At the end of this study, what did they find? They found that the number of children born who were HIV positive to women who, who received the AZT was significantly smaller than the number of children born who were HIV positive to women who received placebo that one study. In the US, what happened is what is known as the 076 regimen becomes standard of care. Now in this country, and then in this country, if you are a pregnant woman with HIV, you would be given the 076 regimen. It was very expensive. It's about $800 to $1,000 per mother-child pair. But this was widely available in the US. A lot of people in the world, or a lot of women in the world, who were HIV positive, and a lot of them are becoming pregnant. In the US, um, at the time, AIDS, um, HIV infection was prominent among um, MSM, or men who have sex with men. In other areas of the world, it is very much a heterosexual disease. In poor countries, we have a lot of pregnant women who are HIV positive. Could they get the 076 regimen? No. Places like Thailand, per capita health expenditure per year, $10. $10 for all the health care per individual. Not just for HIV, not for pregnancy, health care, period. Okay? Was the 076 regimen going to be available to these women in these countries? No. So someone thought, well, what if we don't need? that long course of the 076 regimen? What if we don't need to be giving AZT to pregnant women you know, at the end of the first trimester? What if we start later in pregnancy? What if we just do it later on? It will reduce the cost significantly. And wouldn't this be a big help? Because now, in countries um, that aren't as affluent as the US, treatment might become more effective, might be, become more affordable and widely available. So they decided the, uh, so now I'm going to talk about the second experiment. And I should say that this was in 1996. The Ministry of Public Health of Thailand and a university in Thailand, in collaboration with the CDC here in the US, initiated a randomized placebo controlled trial to test the, what I'm going to call the short course of 076 regimen to reduce perinatal transmission of HIV. 
right? So to reduce the transmission of HIV from pregnant women who were HIV positive to their children. AZT was not administered to these women um, at the end of the first trimester, early second trimester of pregnancy. Um, I'm trying to see if I have a, a, the actual numbers here. I have the date, I have the study here so I can look it up if you have particular questions. Um, but let me just tell you a little bit about the study. So at the time in Thailand, women were getting nothing. 076 regimen was available in the US, not available in Thailand, right? Because it's 800 to $1,000 per mother-child pair, okay? Um, so they do the study in Thailand, placebo controlled trial. Half the women get nothing, half the women get the short course of the 076 regimen. So they're getting AZT during their pregnancy, but it's starting much later. Okay. They do the study. Um, I don't know if I need to tell you what the findings are, because the findings wouldn't justify the study if you think there was, it was ethically problematic. The results of the study were, however, published in the weekly morbidity and mortality report put out by the CDC. And many people in the U.S. were outraged. Many people wrote letters, letters to the editor, and there was this debate conducted um, in letter sections of top American journals, with some people saying, how could this happen? Didn't we learn from Tuskegee? This is just like Tuskegee, and this is 1990-something. How can this be repeated? How is it that a study was done in Thailand that would not be ethically approved in the US? And then people on the other side defended the study. So I'm just gonna say just a couple things more and then I wanted to open up to questions. There's a lot you don't know which would make a difference to how you ethically assess the study, but I'm hoping to provoke you into participating so I'm gonna withhold some of that information. Um, I wanted to read to you the, but I seem to have left it down here, perhaps. The Declaration of Helsinki at the time said that all participants in research should receive the um, treatment that is available that is standard of care. And so the question is, well, there's this question about, well, the 076 regimen was standard of care treatment in the US. In the US, if you're a pregnant woman, and you have HIV, you'll get the 076 regimen. In Thailand, there was not. The, zero, the 076 regimen was not available. Okay, so let me just open it up to you. What do you think the ethical problems were? Do you side with, um, some people said this is horrible, there's a double standard. How is it that you did this study in Thailand? Why didn't you do it here? Gentlemen in the back. I think that society generally maintained their populations in crass ignorance. And so the answer, it seems to me, pre it precedes the study and the question of the studies, and that is that we should encourage education among all segments of our society so that individuals may uh, make valid judgments for themselves. Well, presently, I think in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, there's a euthanasia uh, question on the ballot. And I think many persons don't know what that's all about. And as a result, it seems to me, before something like that happens, there should be an educational component. And what, what um, can you be more specific? What education would have been appropriate in this case, and what difference do you think well, would have Well, let me give you a specific example in this area. In New Bedford, and not too distant past, 60% uh, uh, of uh, the female population was HIV positive. And the answer there, and it was an attempted uh, in the clean needle program, was rejected by the town fathers. And uh, the, the, the aspect of that was that if persons came in to get a clean needle, there was an opportunity for counseling, which is education in a sense. That, that thought, that concept was thought to be immoral. That, uh, and so we need as a society to, to think about uh, the fact that we need an educational component to all of this because too many of our citizens, the, the people in Thailand, the women in Thailand, 
uh, long before that, the people in Africa long before that, should be have been educated that their behaviors were problematic and there were ways of altering that behavior so that they would not have been placed at risk. Well, in fact, many of the women who in uh, the poorer countries who are getting becoming HIV infected are becoming infected because um, their husbands are uh, often uh, workers that do a lot of traveling for their work and are involved with commercial sex workers. And women in these countries are often not empowered. They couldn't say to a husband, they don't have the negotiating power to say to a husband, look, you need to wear a condom. The husband could be very upset and you know, say, what are you accusing me of? And they just don't have the power to negotiate those things. Um, Were the women in Thailand notified that they were getting a short course? Is this a question? Yes, it was. there was informed consent. So um, the consent document would have told them that they will be randomized to one of two groups. One group will receive a placebo. That is an injection that will contain an inert substance that is not expected to do anything for them. The other group would get AZT. And they may have been told that the longer a longer regimen of 076 of the AZT um, was effective in a study in the US in reducing the transmission of HIV from mother to child. And what this experiment was about was seeing if the short course would be also effective. Now remember, these women, what was the alternative? If they did not participate in the study, they would be getting nothing. If they do participate in the study, half of them will get nothing. They'll get the placebo. Half of them will get the short, the short course. Would the short course be effective? I'll tell you, in the end, it was. It was found to be effective. And that was, you know, that was great news. Um, but they didn't know that. They were it's sort of like buying a lottery ticket is the way I think of it. They were buying a lottery ticket. By participating in this study, they were buying a chance that maybe they'd get the short regimen and maybe the short regimen would be effective. Um, Yes? Okay, but even the original uh, test that was done here, the women, it was the same kind of thing. It was a chance they didn't know whether exactly. they were going to New York. And most people don't find the study, the first study was performed in the U.S. ethically problematic. The women were told. And they probably, they could have been thinking of themselves as, I'm buying a chance. I might get the placebo, but I might get this regimen, and maybe the regimen will work. No one knew the regimen would work. That's why it was a study, right? <laughs> The problem that people saw was when it went to Thailand. Why did you go to Thailand? Why didn't you do the study in the US? Is there a double standard here? You can't do this, you don't do the study in the US because it's unethical, but it's okay to do it in Thailand? And many people were appalled at this. But let me tell you a few things. First, principle of justice and a principle of rationality. Like cases, ought to be treated similarly. S treat similar cases similarly. If two of my students score an 89 on an exam, a blonde and a redhead, and I give the redhead an A and the blonde a C, they could say, what's going on? We both scored an 89. <laughs> right? They both scored an 89. Similar cases deserve similar treatment. Now, I could say, oh, but one of you was redheaded, and redheads get the A, and blondes who scored 89 don't, right? Um, but that difference isn't the difference that makes a difference. When it comes to scoring someone on a test, it's the number that determines your grade, not your hair color. So the question that is debated is, does the study, um, the study as it might have been performed in the US, similar, relevantly similar, to the study as it would have been performed in Thailand. And there are a few things to know here. First, in the US, women seek prenatal treatment in the first trimester. You find out you're pregnant, you go to the doctor right away, you start taking vitamins, you stop drinking coffee, many people, you stop drinking coffee. In Thailand, people did not seek treatment until the very end of pregnancy. They did not have an infrastructure to administer the daily dose of ACT. Um, 
Those are two reasons then for thinking that the cases weren't as similar. In the US, the, Thailand, the study that was done in Thailand would not have been feasible. Who, what woman in this country who is HIV positive and pregnant would volunteer to participate in a study where she would get either a placebo or the short course of the 076 regimen when if she just went to her doctor, she could get the 076 regimen, which was known to be effective. Women here, we just, we couldn't have done the study because we wouldn't have gotten women to participate. Yes, there isn't free healthcare here. There were, there are poor people in this country and there were probably some women who could not afford the 076 regimen. But you have to have a certain number of participants to carry out a clinical trial. And we just didn't have the numbers of women to do the trial here. So the study wasn't feasible here. It wasn't ethical, because as I said, the Declaration of Helsinki um, has this requirement that says, um, the, be the benefits, risks, burdens, and effectiveness of new methods should be tested against those of the best current prophylactic, diagnostic, and therapeutic methods. So it would have been unethical in this country to have two experimental groups in a study and give neither of the groups the best available treatment. But in Thailand, this U76 treatment wasn't the best available treatment. What women were getting there was nothing. Another thing, many people, what they, after they understand that, okay, the situation in Thailand is different from the situation in the U.S. and had, the study should have been done, in, you know, it was okay in Thailand. What people were upset about was why use a placebo control? Why not compare the short course to the 076 regimen? Why use a placebo? Defenders of the study said this. What question is a study that uses the active control answering? So I understand many of you are science students. You understand that your experiments, if you're in lab, they start with a question, then you have a hypothesis. The question an active control study would answer, would be designed to answer, would be how does the short course the effectiveness of the short course of the 076 regimen compare with the effectiveness of the long course of AZT. Is this a question Thailand needed an answer to? Why did they need to know how the short course compared in effectiveness to the long course? The long course, the 076 regimen wasn't available to them. What they needed to know was, is the short course more effective at reducing the transmission of HIV from HIV positive mother to child than nothing, which is what they were getting. So, defenders of the study said, look, to use an active control would have been to do an experiment in Thailand that would answer a question whose answer they didn't need. By doing a placebo control study, we are answering a question that is relevant to the host country. The question that the people in Thailand needed to know was, is this short course of the 076 regimen more effective than what they were getting, which is nothing? Okay, I've talked, um, but we do have, this my, I think I've gone over and you're all very nice to sit here, but I, I would love to hear from you if you have comments to make. I tried to present both sides, um, but we'll see where you are. Yes? So since it's been determined that the short course is also effective, and they do that now in the U.S.? Do we do the short course now in the U.S.? Yeah, you know, that's a great question. I actually don't know the answer to. I imagine that we do. There would be no, I mean, if I were a pregnant woman, I wouldn't want to take three months of AZT if I didn't have to. Right? Other questions? Yeah. Uh, aren't the questions as to whether, when it's a question of mortality, you use a placebo study at all? I know it's an consent that people consent to doing that, but it seems to me that if you have an, a treatment and you know, if you know anything about the effectiveness, is it ethical to give nothing to people? That's exactly the question. Right? 
And the people who defended the study said, here's what justifies it. If we do the active control, if we compare, if our two experimental groups are the 076 regimen and the short regimen, we're answering the question, how do those two compare? The people in Thailand didn't need to know the answer to that question. What they need to know is it better than nothing. That's what the defenders say. But what you're pointing to is the Declaration of Helsinki says, answer to your just question, your question is, no, you can't give a placebo if a, if a treatment is available. Um, the way the Declaration of Helsinki was worded at the time in 1989 was um, ambiguous. And as I say, this, this Thailand study prompted a lot of discussion back and forth in the medical literature. And the Declaration of Helsinki was revised in 2000. And let's see, then it was revised again in 2002 with a note of clarification addressing this very specific point. Because what people found ambiguous in the earlier version of the, uh, the Declaration of Helsinki was, well, it says that everyone in the study should receive the best available treatment, but does that mean best available anywhere in the world? Or does that mean best available where the study's happening? And, P and the, the Declaration of Helsinki wasn't clear. They have re revised it. And um, you can see all the revisions online. It's not clear how much they clarified it. <laughs> OK, so the 2002 Declaration of Helsinki says um, the, note of, uh, the benefits, risk, burdens, and effectiveness of a new method should be tested against those of the best current prophylactic diagnostic and therapeutic methods. Again, it doesn't say where. The note of clarification issued in 2002. The World Medical Association hereby reaffirms its position that extreme care must be taken in making use of a placebo control trial, and that in general, this methodology should only be used in the absence of existing proven therapy. However, a placebo control trial may be ethically acceptable, right? even if proven therapy is available under the following circumstances. And then they enumerate some circumstances. Um, yeah. Just a point of interest, I know you didn't get to the Henrietta Lacks book, but her son is speaking tonight at Roger Williams University. Yes, and I understand there's a bus trip and many uh, the people who may have been here are going. Yes? Was the short study as good as the long treatment? Um, I think it was not quite as effective, but it was effective. Because that could, if it had been equally, then that could have affected in this country, the long study then? Yes, which uh, goes back to this gentleman's question. And I should look up those numbers. I get, I'm so concerned with motivating the debate and taking sides that I, I lose track of the actual numbers. But that, that would certainly make a difference. Um, yeah? The US was presumably covering the cost of the long study here. Did we also cover the costs of the Thailand study? Uh, you know? Because I'm curious, like, if this, to support the regulations, who incurs the cost of the World Health Organization? And these are ethical questions. Does it matter? Um, does who pays for it make a difference to what's ethically required? If it's a rich pharmaceutical company that's sponsoring the study, do we say then it ought to be paid for? If it's an NGO that's sponsoring the study, do we say, okay, you don't, you don't have to use the long course? I'm sorry, I am, a, um, I am a bioethicist and I, I am a philosopher and I'm so accustomed to just motivating the ethical issues that I, I have um, lost track of some of these important little details <laughs> since I'm usually trying to make an ethical point. But these are great questions um, and you should be able to find answers to these questions uh, without too much difficulty. Yes? Let me say this, the, um, the Belmont Report and the regulations 45 CFR 46 um, that currently govern uh, 
research involving human participants in the US were written at a time when most of this sort of research was done in the US. Increasingly, the research involving human participants is being carried out in countries, in poorer countries. So I work with people in India and Cambodia, and they're getting calls to host research. They're getting a lot of calls to do that. Um, right in ni July 9, 2011, here's one detail I know, the, uh, the Department of Health and Human Services in the U.S. government put out an advance notice for proposed rulemaking. That's a fancy way of saying they have announced that they are going to revise the current regulations that are 45, that are, are called 45 and CFR 46. They are very well um, aware that our regulations don't easily translate abroad. And for international collaborative research, that is people in the U.S. who are doing research collaborating with people abroad, um, it is required that the, the host country um, comply with regulations that the U.S. accepts. And this has made doing this research difficult. So I can't exactly say where we're headed, um, except to say that the regulations are currently, um, there's been discussion for a year. They are taking comments from the public, so you can go online, you can read what the current regulations are, you can read all the complaints that other people have made about the regulations, um, because the US is aiming to change them. Um, it will be interesting to see, indeed, whether the changes are changes that make it easier for investigators, or if the changes are changes that offer better protections to the participants. And I don't know how that's going to end.